but we're going to continue with the organs of the endocrine system as well as the pathways. So this is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So it's focused on the function of the adrenal gland, which is an endocrine gland, also contains neural tissue, um, but it's also going back to those pathways. So the HP um, organ pathways, this hypothalamic pituitary organ pathways we saw in the previous video. So the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, I believe I mentioned this before, you may have heard of it. The HPA axis is involved in all kinds of mood disorders in humans. So depression, anxiety, where dysregulation, meaning malfunction of it or disrupted function can cause problems. So the HPA axis is part of our stress response, our body's response to stress. Historically, in terms of our evolutionary history, this has been really advantageous and it still is. So if we are in the situation where we're seeing a saber tooth tiger or a bear, our bodies are designed to either fight or flight. So fight the um, threat or flight from it, run away from it. And the surge of adrenaline you get is part of this, your heart thumps. Um, those are short-term consequences. It's also a long-term stress that's still advantageous in terms of breaking down glucose so you can recover. Um, and we'll get into some more of those. However, the problem is in our society, our bodies respond to chronic stressors, stress from school, jobs, social stress, the same way we respond to a saber tooth tiger. And when that's chronic, so like every day, it's not good for our bodies. So that's where it can lead to these mood disorders, anxiety, depression, as well as various types of physical issues. Um, all, besides mental is part of physical, but other metabolic effects, weight gain, other dysregulation, um, immune function, etc. So what I want to start with for the eight, we're going to focus on the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is um, hormones being released from the hypothalamus, releasing hormones, triggering a response. But I want to start first with an overview of the stress response, because the hypothalamus controls the stress response in more than one way. So some of this is going to be a review, and this really helps things fit together in terms of what's the point. So if you have a stressor here, let's say you have a stressor, the processing for that, you know, maybe it's coming in from the eyes, the visual system, um, it's processed by whatever sensory system. And oftentimes the amygdala is going to be evolved. So you've probably heard of the amygdala in terms of fight or flight. We're not going to focus on that besides you should just know that name. We talked about the amygdala a little bit in the fall as a brain region involved in anxiety, fear, fight or flight response. The hypothalamus, however, is actually gonna be an output signal of the amygdala. So this is our hypothalamus here. Um, and that was confusing because, so this is a different brain region here. And this whole region right here is our hypothalamus. The amygdala is going to signal that. Um, so this is our hypothalamus. It's a little confusing how I have that. So just remember, this region is the hypothalamus. The amygdala signals to that. Arrows can mean more than one thing. It's kind of annoying. I'm actually gonna have this just be a line marking that that is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus has lots of neurons and shown here are the projections to where you should know what this is. This is our anterior pituitary. And you can tell by the anatomy this portal system here and the, the axons end right at that location. There are also going to be neurons that project from the hypothalamus out to the spinal cord. Out meaning down really, right? The spinal cord is down. Here's our spinal cord. Not my best spinal cord ever, but they can't all be the best ever. There's a synapse here, and it's gonna go from the spinal cord then 
Here's our central canal. Here's our second neuron. Where does the spinal cord project to? We're talking about the short-term stress response. It's going to project, remember this is part of our autonomic nervous system. Oftentimes there is a second neuron chain. We're not gonna go there right now. Right now, we're gonna to go to the adrenal medulla, the adrenal gland. And specifically, I'm actually gonna have this go. So the medulla is the inside part. And this axon is gonna go all the way down into the adrenal medulla. What's in the adrenal medulla? I'm gonna switch colors here just to bury it up a little bit. There are cells and those cells are going to produce what? Norepinephrine and epinephrine. These signaling molecules are going to go into the bloodstream because that's where they go from this, these cells here. You're gonna go into the bloodstream um, and this is going to be your fight or flight, quick ANS, short-term stress response, adrenaline, fight or flight. What are some effects of this? We're gonna have increased heart rate, um, increased blood pressure, increased respiration, breathing, increased glucose mobilization. So glucose traveling around in our blood. Um, all things that we need to be able to have to be able to fight or run from a bear. At the same time, these stress, so this is a short-term stress response, immediately run from that bear. At the same time, those same stressors cause these cells right here to release what? We've done this. This is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. You may not remember, corticotropin releasing hormone. So this is a second response to that stress. CRH is going to travel to the anterior pituitary and is going to signal the release of what? Adrenocorticotropin hormone. A hormone that is going to be a tropic hormone for the adrenal gland. This ACTH is gonna travel through the bloodstream and is going to target what? The adrenal gland, but where? Actually the cortex. The adrenal cortex contains other cells, still endocrine cells, that are going to release hormones, different hormones, right? These cells don't produce epinephrine and norepinephrine. It's not what they do. What do they produce? They're going to produce glucocorticoids, for example, cortisol. There's also mineral corticoids such as aldosterone. We'll come back to that with the urinary system. Cortisol is the, really the one I want you to focus on right now. Cortisol is a stress hormone. It's released in response to stress. It's gonna have some similar effects to your adrenaline, but they're kind of more for long-term. So this is going to be, this is our long-term stress. So this is beneficial because if we are running from a bear, we want to be able to break down proteins and fats into what? Well, amino acids, um, fatty acids, glucose. So break down all foods. Um, glycogen is glucose, fat. So we're gonna have increased blood glucose, increased amino acids for making new proteins, responding to that stress by building things um, proteins that are needed for emergencies, um, fats for ultimately being metabolized and more energy use. So ATP production through several of these. It's also going to maintain the blood pressure, 
um, and suppress the immune system. And that you may have heard of um, corticosterone treatments is our immune suppressants. And those are sometimes topical creams that suppress the immune system because they use their, their, cort their cortisol. So that's kind of a review um, slash integration of what you already know. Um, and that's the stress response. Let's look at this with this lovely picture here. So here is our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Corticotropin releasing hormone is produced in the hypothalamus. Here's CRH. What is this? This is a peptide. It's a peptide hormone. And it's produced here, travels down to the anterior pituitary and is going to trigger ACTH. ACTH is also a peptide hormone. That means both of these hormones bind to G protein coupled receptors to have their effects. ACTH is going to bind to the adrenal gland. That's what's right here. And the adrenal gland is going to release cortisol. Here is cortisol. What is cortisol? This is a steroid hormone derived from cholesterol. It can pass right through cell membranes and is going to cause changes in gene expression. So the stress response, glucose metabolism, immune suppression, immune suppression is from cortisol binding to its receptor. So cortisol is going to bind to what's called a, let's see, on some target tissue, target cell. So maybe the liver where there's glycogen stored there are going to be glucocorticoid, glucocorticoid receptors that bind glucocorticoids, cortisol. So this receptor is present various places throughout the body. It's going to be um, how cortisol exerts its effect. Glucocorticoid receptor acts as transcription factor, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Cortisol also feeds back to turn off signaling in the hypothalamus and pituitary. So, hey, the hypothalamus and pituitary, they both have glucocorticoid receptors as well. Cool, huh? Okay, let's draw this with the feedback. Oops, don't look at that. I wanted to draw it out first. <laughs> so I wanted to like go through and label these. Um, can you label these? So what's this region up here? This is the hypothalamus. What's it releasing? CRH, it's gonna target the anterior pituitary, which releases ACTH. ACTH is going to target the adrenal cortex, part of the adrenal gland, which is going to release cortisol. Oops, cortisol, which is going to then target tissues and cause a response. This is going to bind to glucocorticoid receptors, cause a response. Now we can see the nicer one um, looks like this. Same thing I drew. And the other important thing that's there is this negative feedback, right? So the cortisol is the thing that's feeding back. The response addresses our stimulus. It fixes it, but it doesn't um, directly turn off the system. It's going to stop it from responding. But the negative feedback actually is coming from cortisol acting at the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. They contain receptors that bind to cortisol. So these can become the, the dysregulation that occurs in anxiety and depression is very complex. We're going to be looking at something a little simpler in terms of dysfunction of a organ in this pathway and its result on cortisol levels. So the, one of these examples is Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome is marked by weight gain, hair growth, easily bruising and fatigue. And this is caused by high levels of cortisol. So Cushing syndrome, the indicator of it is high cortisol. The, the 
the cause of it. And these are some of the symptoms. So I want you to think about high cortisol, okay? What could cause that? So here's two questions. What structures could be dysfunctional, theoretically, to cause high cortisol? Draw out the HPA axis and show where this dysfunction could occur and whether those, that's causing hormones to be high or low. 